1972 to 3, it was a difficult time in the UK. It was four years after Enoch Powell's Rivers of Blood speech. We had the National Front marching on the street. And the other side of that, and I remember that as being a particularly awful time, really, in some aspects. But the other side of that was that in those areas where we established the resettlement camps, 16 of them, in mostly in rural areas, when local people heard about what had happened to the Ugandan nations, that they were leaving Uganda with only what they could carry, people came out in their droves, they provided food, they provided clothing in the case. There are some lovely stories, such as a woman who gave birth shortly after arriving here from Uganda, and local people to the Stradishall camp in mid-Suffolk gave her a crib and some baby clothes. So people were so welcoming, even though they had never seen people of colour, they may not have known anything about Uganda, the heritage, the history. They saw people in need who they wanted to help, and they did. I suppose my interest in this, in the Uganda Resettlement Board, is that my father was the director of the Uganda Resettlement Board from 1972 until the board closed down in 1974. He worked very hard. I was a teenager at the time. I remember not seeing very much of him. Uh, during the week, uh, they were working hard in London on the resettlement board at weekends. He used to visit the camps. When it finished, he didn't actually say very much about it. It's only latterly, as I've been looking through his papers and realising the story of what happened, that I have begun to think, actually, the Uganda Resettlement Board and my dad at the time did a pretty good job. It really is something of a success story that's, that's by and large forgotten. I am proud of his work. I'm proud of what Britain did at the time. We didn't get it all right by any means, but I am proud of what Britain did at the time in terms of receiving 28,606 people um, and the way that they were resettled so promptly. My father worked with um, Sir Charles Cunningham. Sir Charles Cunningham was the chairman of the Uganda Resettlement Board. My father was the director. So between them, they had overall responsibility for the operations and the direction. They liaised with other government departments to make sure that they could get things done. And I think because they, they, they knew each other, they had worked well together in the past. They were able to cut through some of the red tape. One of the stories that I've heard fairly recently was that there was a very clear edict from Wales that they weren't going to have any Uganda nations in Wales, full stop, period. What my father then did was talk to the army and say, please, can you reopen the Tonfanai camp? He talked to, talked to British Rail and said, look, can you run some trains specially from Stansted to Tonfanai? So the camp was opened, the trains were running, and they didn't take no for an answer. We know that the Tonfanai camp was something of a success. Some fantastic people went there and have moved on to, to do great things in, in British life. So they were able to cut through the red tape and not take no for an answer. And that, I think, is quite unusual in the civil service and in the public sector. But it took that kind of mindset, I think, to ensure that they could get 16 camps up and running between the 4th of August when Idi Amin gave his awful edict and the 18th of September when the first plane landed at Stansted. So they established the 16 camps, they banded together 63 voluntary organisations and I guess you don't always do that by following policy and procedure and being cautious. I remember when my father was asked to do this, he was very excited about it. Um, it was a great project for him to be involved in and he, he really liked to do things. So I was pleased for him. I did actually go to, to the Uganda Resettlement Board one, one, one day on a Saturday because I wanted to see what was happening. I mean, I was interested. I was engaged. I just I loved the story and I loved, loved what we were doing for the country. So I remember going there and seeing so many people. I think it was either a Saturday, it was probably a Saturday rather than a Sunday. But I mean, lots of people at work, lots of people on the phone. There were boards all around the rooms which had the flight arrivals and how many people were in which camp. So I remember real buzz there. And I can also remember the phone ringing non-stop. 
At one point, I went with my dad to Stradishall camp. My father was being interviewed for a BBC radio programme. Whilst he was being interviewed, I took the opportunity to wander around the camp. I talked to a few people who were there. Um, I saw the catering, I saw the hall, I saw where people were staying. One of the things I remember was the real mixture and diversity, to some extent, of the volunteers. There were people of quite mature years. Um, and some very young students, long hair, kind of stereotypical at the time. So there was a great mixture of, of people. I think what I do remember is just that it felt, it felt calm. It felt calm and it felt welcoming and, um, and it felt like a nice, an, an okay place to be. At the time, I knew what had happened. I knew why the expellees were coming here. I knew what Amin had done. It's only as I've got older and particularly, I suppose, as I've become more engaged in the project recently that it's caused me to think what would it be like for me leaving leaving my country with only what I could carry. I certainly didn't at the time appreciate what it was like for the people who arrived. I think, I hope, that some of the volunteers who, who received them did. As a 16-year-old at the time, I didn't. But now I feel the very profound impact that it must have been like arriving in this country with only what you could carry. And I keep reminding myself that there had been months of trauma beforehand when people didn't know what was happening coming to a strange land and having to remake your life again. And I find it very hard to put myself in those shoes. So, I mean, my respect goes out to those people who've done it and have made a huge success of their lives. As a civil servant, my father was quite idealistic. He joined the civil service because he wanted to change the world as an idealistic teenager. He had a few high profile jobs and he was able to make quite an impact in his career. As a civil servant he didn't stick to the safe options. He subsequently is known for having pretty much reformed the police service. He was involved in community relations um, in the early 70s. So this role with the Uganda Resettlement Board was very much in his brief. He wanted to play a part in having a better society. He wouldn't have recognised it at the time but he was someone who liked diversity. He liked different cultures. He was proud of the country, but proud of the impact that different people had made on the country. So when he was given the option of the Uganda Resettlement Board, I'm absolutely sure that it wouldn't have occurred to him for a minute to say no, this is potentially a difficult role, so I won't take it. He would have absolutely lapped it up. And he did. During his career, he was principal private secretary to Rab Butler, who was the reforming home secretary, who did a lot of work in changing the prison, the prison system. He then worked with the police during the 60s, is credited now with having modernised the police. He then moved in the early 70s to community relations and worked on some community development projects. So about what we would call now the levelling up agenda, how you have more equality in, in local areas. When he was asked to be director of the Uganda Resettlement Board, it was very much within his brief. He loved, he loved things like that and he would have seen it as being just something that he wanted to do because he could make a difference. I also don't think that he realised quite the achievement of the Uganda Resettlement Board because that 16 camps in six weeks and 63 voluntary organisations banded together hasn't been equalled. I think he did it at the time because it was the right thing to do. I think if he were here now and were looking back at what we are doing, the way we're working post-Afghanistan and with Ukraine, I think he would be thinking, why aren't you using the same model that we used? Because actually it worked. And where are the brave people who are going to cut through the red tape um, and actually just make things happen? I think talking to some of those people now who volunteered, they just saw it as the right thing to do at the time. I don't have any impression that they thought, actually, I'm doing a great thing here. And they were doing quite something quite special. I don't think they thought that. I think they were just thinking that from the WRVS point of view, they were doing what they did through the WRVS, through the community service volunteers, they were doing another bit of community service work. I think they just did what they did at the time 
received no particular accolades for it and then drifted off and did other things in the community or other aspects of voluntary work. One of the larger volunteer organisations at the time was the Women's Royal Voluntary Service, the WRVS, who were enormously helpful. I mean, they, they had a national network and they had access to a lot of volunteers who were able to be mobilised very quickly and to provide things like clothing. When people arrived at Stanstow's for direct from Kampala, there were huge piles of coats ready, gathered together largely by, by the WRVS. The legacy that I would like to see is that we will have an oral history archive and those are recordings of some of those volunteers and some of those the family members of the volunteers at the time. And it's really important that we keep that oral history archive because they are wonderful stories about why people came out and volunteered to receive people of colour, people that they had never met before. Certainly those Ugandan nations who arrived as expellees have made a huge contribution to this country and not everyone in the country wanted the Ugandan nations to come here. But you as volunteers did receive them, you made them welcome.